Hi, it's Dr. Marino again with another sound check retake of one of the earlier videos. This is the one on the three kinds of love. So, book three of the Fairy Queen is about chastity, but also really about love, which leads us to the question, what is love? What is love, dude? Do not write me a paper or even a long exam essay trying to answer the question, what is love, dude? Let's take it for granted that various people have various answers, and more importantly for our purposes, various times and places have had their own culturally specific answers to the question, what is love? What makes it tricky, and maybe in a productive way for Spencer, is that Spencer's Fairy Queen is working with at least three, count them, three kinds of love, at least three which do not naturally to go together, some of which can be made to go together with a little work, a little effort, a little finesse, um, and, uh, but they're not naturally from the same environment at all. First, there is courtly love, which we've already seen done wrong by our boy Absalom in The Miller's Tale. What is courtly love? Courtly love, again, is this thing that comes, origi it comes originally from the Arabic Islamic world, into the poetic culture of southern France, the troubadours, or the trouvères, from which it spreads, from whom it spreads out to all of France and to French-speaking Francophone England. Remember, medieval England was ruled by a French-speaking ruling class for only only about three, four hundred years. To Italy, where it's refined by Petrarch and Dante and other, and Petrarch's the pioneer of the sonnet. We're not reading any sonnets, but characters in the fairy queen will stop and drop a kind of sonnet riff at length time and again. Um, courtly love is an aristocratic thing, an aristocratic theory of love, which it comes from the courts. I mean, the court meaning the group of noblemen and ladies or and servants around elite servants, the knights, etc., around a monarch or an important nobleman. At these courts, these elite people have various kinds of love affairs, real and imagined. And what happens here? The language is it's about lovers suffer. And there's great detail about the suffering. The suffering is they don't, lover doesn't sleep, lover doesn't eat, turns pale, sighs a lot, has various intestinal complaints. We will hear the lover complains. We will hear character after character, characters we like, characters we don't like, Characters we used to like till they started complaining. Characters who we don't think of as big whiners nonetheless go off on this traditional courtly love complaint about how miserable love is making them. The courtly lover is miserable. The courtly lover offers service to the beloved. I want to be your servant. Not volunteers isn't requested. Um, Courtly love is intensely visual. It usually, it typically, it stereotypically starts at first sight. Sometimes you can be in totally true courtly love with someone you've never spoken with, and more importantly, someone who's never spoken to you. This sounds like someone's in your imagination. Yeah, that's a current, that's a riff on this kind of behavior. It is one-sided. The lover always loves the beloved more than, than the beloved loves the lover back. Sometimes the lover is completely unrequited. In fact, if the love is unrequited, that only makes it purer. They're suffering more. Aren't they great? And the normal rhetorical pitch here, the persuasive part of court of love is, oh, my lady, my lady, I am your humble servant. I suffer so for love of you. Why don't you take pity on me. Also, it's important to, this, to note that this form, this theory of love is initially, originally, proscriptively heterosexual. It's really about men loving women. And even the gender reversal we do of Britain is a bit of a surprise. It's, it's, it's not same sex, it's heterosexual. And it really has different roles, usually, for the man and the woman, where the man is doing the looking, the loving, the suffering, the complaining, and with the complaining, the demanding. Um, it is also 
outside marriage fundamentally. It's about it's not about a happy marriage. It's about it's not about a couple who are going to live together, share property, raise children, look forward to the future, die in old age together. That's not what courtly love is about. It's passionate, romantic, and there's a lot of there's often a lute involved. Um, there you know, be serenades and poems, but it happens outside marriage, prior to marriage, or specifically adulterously. You fall in love with somebody else's wife. Oh, lady, pity me, pity me, pity me. Absalom didn't get that part wrong. It was adulterous from jump. Now, if what I've just described sounds both familiar in that it got into our pop songs, all our pop songs about baby, baby, I love you so, you make me miserable, can't sleep, can't eat. <laughs> yes, those are still familiar and indeed popular ideas with us. I mean, when we hear those torch songs on the radio, we, we know what, the, we smell what they're cooking, we get that. that court, those courtly love ideas have kind of proliferated into our general culture as a kind of cultural common sense. This also sounds like something that might lead to behaviors that cause restraining orders, and rightly so, yes, that too. Because the courtly love tradition is very one-sided, it's about how the man imagines the woman, and yeah, and it can be kind of controlling. Um, Spencer isn't, Spencer isn't as interested in the dark side of that until he really is. By the end of this poem, you will see the dark side of love. Oh goodness, will you? Okay, courtly love, theory number one. Theory number two is what is called neoplatonic love. Not we use platonic to mean love without sex. That this platonic love initially means no, according to the platonic theories of the great Greek philosopher Plato, specifically his theory of love as laid out in his masterpiece uh, Socratic dialogue, the Symposium, in which a bunch of ancient Greeks, including Socrates, who is uh, Plato's old teacher who always writes about it as a kind of mouthpiece. Socrates, Plato writes about Socrates saying the things that initially are things Socrates taught and then seem to be things that Plato wants Socrates to say. Anyway, Socrates and the boys stay up all night drinking, discussing the nature of love. What is love, man? And they come up with different answers. The Socrates and Plato answer is this. Love is ennobling, and this becomes, I'm sorry, this becomes Neoplatonic the Renaissance in Western Europe rediscovers this and tweaks it a little bit. So it's the new version of Plato, suitable for our less Greek, more Christian culture. Plato teaches there's a ladder of love, and it goes like this. First, you see a beautiful person, and you're filled with desire for them. This is perfectly sexual, too. And then... Often the next step is then you fall in love with like an idea, and Plato's all about the ideas of what that person could be, the idealized version of them, which is not quite them, but the better them. And then your love of their beauty makes you feel love for beauty generally. You become in love with beauty, you become in love with beauty itself, and then step by step, rung by rung, up the ladder, you are moved by love to embrace loftier and loftier, more and more general moral abstractions. So you get up to some cloudy place at the top of the Plato verse where the beautiful and the good and the true that just all kind of merge together. Um, wow, it's wonderful. So here, love is ennobling. It makes you, moves you up high. It's supposed to move you up higher and makes you more spiritual. In Plato's system, the more general and abstract, the better. Specific is bad. General is good. A generalization is always of more value than a specific fact. And that kind of the way things were in your 10th grade English class. This is a 300 level college English class where we love specifics and generalities have much less value. Where staying at the level of lofty generality is often leads us to spin our wheels as writing. So specifics are good. Now that all sound, might sound great to us because this idea has also permeated our Western culture and it might be familiar to us. It sounds like other things we agree with. I would point out this problem to you. In this system, the actual person you're in love with is, what is the word I want? A rung, a rung on the ladder, just one rung on the ladder 
and the bottom rung on the ladder. I ain't gonna tell, I ain't gonna tell my spouse that she's the bottom rung on any ladders anytime now. According to Plato, you, you see, you go out and you see, uh, someone with really sexy ankles and you're like, oh man, sexy ankles. It's good to be Greek. And you fall in love with them, and you, you, then you're sexually attracted, and then you're attracted to their higher qualities, then you're attracted to who they ought to be, and then you're attracted to beauty per se, and you move on up away to some lofty thing. And they were just about getting you up to believing in these, like, abstract virtues. Yeah. You know. Or you could hang out with the person you're, you're you know, just stay here in the actual phenomenal world and enjoy the date, Plato. Um... Okay, this is not normatively, this is not necessarily happening in marriage. It is not normatively heterosexual. In fact, in Plato's writing, it's normatively homosexual. Um, before you think, oh, Plato's such a liberal, it's, it's homosexual because misogynist, because Plato views women, also views women as intellectually inferior, and how can you really love someone as intellectually inferior? You can't shoehorn the distant past into our politi into our politics. They will say things that seem very progressive to us, and the same person will say things that seem like, oh, you're really, you've been dead a long time, haven't you? You really are not up to date. Okay. Third, on top of all this, there's a Christian idea of love, or Christian rules about love, which don't necessarily fit either of these two other theories, but which Spencer also enormously values. Christianity has a lot of terms for love. It, has, it actually breaks up into different kinds of love. Um, and in fact, there are various Greek words used in Christian discourse for different kinds of love. But eros, the love between two romantic or erotic or sexual partners in Christianity, is very much focused on marriage, on the religious uh, the religious goal of marriage in which the, in which the lovers, the, the spouses, actually are imagined as metaphysically fusing into essentially becoming one big person. This is not something I'm telling you is true. I'm saying it's a, it's a theological idea that strongly informs Christian history. Okay, and you know, and it involves chastity, and there's no sex before marriage, and there's all kinds of rules. Okay, here we go. These are all valid in their own way. These are all models that have strengths and weaknesses, and each is independent. All three have been forcibly, before Spencer got to them, you can put e any two of these together with a little force and ignoring a few details, you can make it work. So you can take courtly love and Neoplatonism and people before Spencer would not be like, yeah, right? And you're in courtly love, and it's in the ennobling. I'm having ennobling Neoplatonic courtly love. I love this person. I'm suffering. I'm serving it. But then I'm also climbing the ladder and being ennobled by it. Um, at one point, about halfway through, a little more than halfway through, the fairy queen will meet a character who falls in love, just like the others, except he's, he's actually criticized because he's not rising up the ladder. He just really, really wants to have sex with that person. No, 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 no. Oh, you base churl, you. Okay, you can do that. You can also combine the Christianity and the Neoplatonism, like it can be done like it had been done already by Italians. We're like, all right, okay, like you're rising up the ladder to the higher and higher virtues, and then isn't the highest virtue God, right? God's up there, that ultimate truth. Plato's a, pay, a pre Christian pagan, but like that, well, where the good and the true and the virtuous all come together, that's where God is. So boom, we made it Christian. Great. It's, but it's hard to keep any two of these together and then put it all three together. It's, it's, it, it. Spencer is committed to combining all three of these different and on some level incompatible models of love into one super complicated, perfect version of love. It's a kind of like what he's doing, like mess kind of remixing all these poetic forms into one super amazing complicated poem. It's going to be one super complicated thing. If he can make it work. Oh, man. Oh, man. You're in trouble, man. It's a good thing you're an insanely talented poetic genius because you're going to need it. You're going to need all your crazy talent to get you out of this one, Ed.